Hello, welcome back to Voices of the Great War. I'm Liz Watson. Today we are going to be reading another letter from the Hare family. If we remember Molly, she is on the home front and she is writing to her fiance, Joe. He is a lieutenant and he is stationed in France during World War I. So the letter that we have today, this is Molly's letter and she wrote this on September 14th. So we can see the envelope as well as the letter. It's actually um, about six pages long. So this is just one of those pages here. And Molly's letter to Joe reads, Dearest Joe, it is awfully late and I am dead tired, but I can't resist talking to you a little because I might not get a chance tomorrow. And I couldn't ever let two days go by without talking to my little lover, True. First of all, I'm in Upton at Center Morakes. Isn't it a queer world? I never expected to see this place again, but surely was glad to know about it tonight. My, what a relief it was to know a little about the place. We went right to the officer's house and called brother up. He's in the base hospital with an infected foot, and all I'm hoping is that they'll take him along anyway because he's surely ready to go. You can imagine my feeling, dear, when I came in that room. I would unconsciously look up for you, oh lover dear, how I've wanted you tonight. The porch where we walked up and down and talked to each other of our plans. The very chair seemed to miss you, Joe. I felt it more every time I looked around. Then when we came over here tonight, well, I can't believe that I won't see you in the morning. Do you realize, dear one, how it makes me feel? Not blue, not unhappy, just a queer vacancy like stretching out for things unseen, as Elizabeth Browning once said. The camp seems quite crowded, but there are very few women around. I suppose the waiting is not so long these days. Oh, lover, dear, my love tonight is soaring right over to you. The incident charge today at the office was certainly fine about letting me go. He told me to leave early and that I should not report until five o'clock Monday night. My hours all next week will be 5 to 11, which is really a fine watch. Most of the girls leave their night watch hours from 7.30 to 1 and 1 a.m. to 8. But I told Ensign Lynch that I was from out of town and couldn't get home at 1. He's awfully nice, but a kind of serious type and about 42 or 43 years old. He was certainly a peach to let me come, wasn't he? The Lord is good to me in so many ways, which makes me feel sure he's going to be good in the one big thing in my life, your safe return. My darling, you and only you realize it, and we're playing the game together as far as that part of it goes. We're bearing this separation, this longing with a strength which I probably would never have realized you possess and you would never have known I was capable of. And how much more will value the love after it, Oh, Joe, as I have told you so often, I don't want to ever have a thought, a look, a word, or a deed which is not pleasing to you after this test. And I realize constantly that from the minute we are once more together, we are going to be so dear than ever to each other. That blessed dream of day. I must tell you of the pleasant surprise I had today. A lovely letter from one of your French hostesses. I'm going to quote the whole thing to you because I treasure it so much that I don't want to risk sending it, and yet I want you to fully realize how lovely it is. My dearest Miss Molly, two weeks ago we had the pleasure to receive your dear fiancé. I am very glad to tell you of the good impression he made to us all, and that when he spoke of you and of his parents he left behind, he told us his little fiancé was so brave. I'm sending you a little souvenir. It's a play my girls performed some years ago, touching our country here. The view of a say is quite the same, even now. I must tell you that we were so happy your fiancé felt quite at home with us. We find him not we find him most brave and cheerful, just like your great America, who was so splendidly just now paying her debt of gratitude to our dear France. Let us hope we shall soon have victory as entirely and gladly as we deserve it. Let us hope too that God will pers preserve our dear soldiers. My best wishes go with your dear one. God bless you and noble America. I am sending you my best wishes. Yours truly, Marie Therese Bartholomew. It is from Bisset, 
with the same little chateau on the paper as you sent to me when you were there. Bless her heart, isn't it beautiful? You see, I am not the only one who loves you, and it only shows that my thoughts of your real worth are not the result of my love. In other words, ours is not a case of love is blind. How perfectly lovely for her to write so sweetly, and my heart simply exploded with warmth and regard for her. She is the same dear woman who so typically puts the white rose by the picture. Joe, dear, write to her and tell her how glad she made my heart and how she gave me new strength. I shall write too, but I want her to know that I was so happy about it. I shall send it to our little mother to read, but I am going to ask her to return it as it is very, very precious to me. I talked to Elgin over the phone just now. He's at the base hospital, but he feels sure they will take him. He had his foot lanced today and the pain of course is relieved. He said the captain guaranteed they couldn't leave him and that's all he cares about. I have two dear ones in the army and am living for the day when this will be over and they'll come back. I feel very confident, dear, of our good fortune. You can't possibly know how I want you this night. I feel that I can almost stretch out my hand and touch you, but you are not there. Oh, how I love you. My sweet, happy kisses and my smile. Good luck, your Molly. So we can really see in Molly's letter to Joe, you know, obviously how much she's really missing him. And it was also very interesting and nice to be able to read that part or that bit of the letter that was sent to Molly from the hostess who um, actually had the opportunity to welcome Joe into her home in France. And a lot of the soldiers, they were, they were, um, they stayed in houses um, in various parts of France during the war while it was going on. And obviously he made quite the impression on them as well as being a brave and kind soul. So that was awfully nice that Molly received that letter. We can also see, it sounds like she's probably working um, at a base as well. And she said doing a night watch. So she's keeping herself busy um, while she's waiting for Joe to return home. So I do have a couple of interesting things today. So the first we're going to look at is another one of those reports that we have from the 82nd here. And we're going to read. So this report, it is it's a secret. And this is of the 82nd Division, American Expeditionary Force, France, Operation Report number 73, September 14th, 1918. So this is the same day that Molly wrote that letter. And this states, the weather was clear, visibility was fair, general impression of the day, active. On the American side, the infantry activity. The 325th Infantry, Special Patrol, 30 men encountered enemy outpost, at Ouvrange de Vervais Epley at 386.2-235.4. Lightly shelled on return, no casualties. Patrol 33 men from Morville to 385.6-237.2, then to 385.5-236.8 heavily fired upon by enemy artillery, no casualties. 326 infantry report combat, combat troops in Chenoweth Woods during night, but were driven out by heavy gas shelling from enemy. 327th infantry at 18 o'clock, companies E and K supported by our artillery executed a successful raid on Bel Air Farm and Boy Pro. There were some casualties, but none killed. One prisoner and a machine gun brought back. Enemy order of battle confirmed. 328th Infantry have pushed forward their line to a position just north of Noroy. And then the infantry activity on the German side. Slight machine gun and rifle fire from direction of Epley during night, heavy machine gun fire from Furrow Woods, heavy trench mortar fire from northwest of Zon Hill, 
Enemy infantry have vacated several lines of trenches in front of 328th sector. The artillery activity. We have the 325th infantry report 196 77s and five 105s distributed over their area. The 326th Infantry Report Zon Hill heavily shelled at 18.30 o'clock. Front lines of this sector shelled from 2300 to 2400 o'clock. Boy de Chamon shelled at intervals during night with HE and gas. 325th Infantry Report 2 169 77s, 453 105s, 38 150s on their area, 80 gas shell in vicinity of Zon Hill, 52 gas shell on Forêt de Falk, and several on Pont à Mousson. 328th Infantry Report 177s on Madere, 150 105s on Pont à Mousson, and Road to Blanade. Aerial activity, active patrolling by allied planes. 325th Infantry report three enemy planes over Morville, one over Port de Chalau. 327 Infantry report three planes over lines, one of which attacked and destroyed one of our balloons. Following balloons noted, Moreau, Demont, and Prenet. Casualties. 321st Field Artillery, 325th Infantry, and 327th Infantry included. One enlisted man slightly wounded by shell fire, one enlisted man severely wounded accidental, two officers slightly gassed, three officers slightly wounded by shell fire, one officer severely wounded by shell fire, 28 enlisted men slightly gassed, two enlisted men severely gassed, 21 enlisted men slightly wounded by shell fire, 13 enlisted men severely wounded by shell fire. Movements, 328th Infantry, occupying Nero and vicinity, PC in Nero, front line extended on parallel 239 from 374.5-376.1. 3rd Battalion South of Naroy, PC, Emadere. Work. 307th Engineers, 400 men working on position of resistance, one company working during night on Port Sor Soleil, Epley Bridge. Miscellaneous. 325th Infantry report three Allied planes brought down in an encounter with five enemy triplanes at 7.15 o'clock two English officers, observer, and pilot killed. 328th Infantry advised the body of Lieutenant Harrison killed on September 12th and body missing has been recovered. Three enlisted men reported as missing have returned. They are all slightly wounded. One man from 68th Ludwig 255th Division captured this morning. 326th Infantry report enemy planes brought down in flames by our artillery fire. J.M. Wainwright, Assistant Chief of Staff. And you can even see the little stamped there. So it's kind of interesting. And again, it was interesting to note that that report was written on September 14th, the same day as Molly's letter was written. So we can kind of see what was going on there. And again, it, it had to, you know, the not knowing and this is a time again in September where there was a lot of active fighting going on September into October and November. You know, the war again, it's winding, it's winding down, but the, the fighting was still very active. Um, still, we still had a lot of casualties. So again, it really hard, had to be so very hard for Molly to um, that, just that not knowing, of course. And it's frequently we talk about that, that not knowing that the family's experienced on, on this side. Because most, a lot of our letters we have read, are read have been, again, from soldiers, so we get to hear some of their point of view. But it's also interesting to hear from the family members as well, to hear what they're going through. And in, in the letter um, that the hostess wrote to Molly, 
she did speak of how Joe had said how brave his fiance was back home. And it was really brave of those family members because the waiting is excruciating. It's hard. I mean, there's some, sometimes there's nothing worse than that. So um, it, it was, it was very brave of the family members back home to um, send their boys, their loved ones over there. And I do have a couple of artifacts to show today. So the first one is actually behind me. We have duck boards. So duck boards were actually placed in the base of the trenches and the reason, and also in other very muddy areas. And the reason why these duck boards, which are just wood, kind of wood panels there, they're placed in the base of those trenches because the trenches could get so muddy, so muddy, and they stayed muddy for extended periods of time. So what happened was when that occurred, you know, that would lead to trench foot and infected feet, and that could be just lethal for the boys. So it, um, it was very important to kind of combat that and the duck boards was one of those methods. So they just placed them down there so the boys had something to walk on rather than in the mud. Then the next thing that we have, this is what we call um, trench art. So they would take the shells of the old shells and they would actually create designs out of those trench art. We can kind of see this as a kind of see how it's an old shell. So there's lots of trench art out there and not just vases, but other things as well. Well, thank you for joining us on Voices of the Great War. And until next time, I'm Liz Watson.